I don't go nowhere unless there's business for me there. Done, no, void, zero. And I've been like that since I was 20. I hate the weekends. I hate I'm it going out. I agree. I think you really are like that. I hate yeah. it going out on Fridays and Saturdays yeah. since I was 20, Felicia, because I knew it was amateur night. My nights to go out were Sundays and Thursdays since I was 20. That was my thinking. I don't want to go on the weekends with those fucking mutts. So I would never go on the weekends with mutts. I always went out on those two nights, like I told you, and during the week. The, more, the, if I, the people I see on Tuesday, they're the people I want to run with. Yeah. Because they're not worried about shit. Even if they stay out till <laughs> 6, they're going to go to work great at 8. That's Joey Diaz rule. If he, if I, I, I would why would so, I want to yeah, hang yeah. out with people who run on Fridays and Saturdays, the amateurs? I remember looking at people in the face when I was 20 and going, they're like, so what are you going to do tonight? You're going to go? Like, and I'm like looking at them like, no. I'm going to get a gram of Coke, an eight-pack of beer, and I'm going home. And they would look at me like I was from another planet. And I was content with that. And then I moved to Colorado. You know how Colorado is. Like, the yeah. whole community goes to the same fucking bar and some band playing Bob Seger. That was never for fucking me. Like, to watch a cover band, uh-uh. Yeah. No, that's two minutes of my fucking time. And it's so weird how you and I get along and I love all your little family functions and that's where it ends. Like, anything bigger than a family thing, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'll true, tell you, you I'll like tell that. you whatever the fuck you want to hear, yeah. but... Yeah. <laughs> it's really, and, and that's where the thing is. I think when people are in big groups, the bullshit comes out. Oh, maybe, yeah. And people yeah. want to pick up people, and people talk to people with alcohol and drugs in yeah. their system. I don't want to talk to well, you. Well, I think because we're, this whole, got, whole thing got started because a friend of mine uh, years ago went to a party, and uh, uh, she's lovely with painting, and uh, uh, this guy at a party where everyone was drinking said to her, oh, you're just like a housewife that likes to paint. And so she got that in her mind. So now she like struggles with, you know, even doing it or whenever she does do it, it's never in a positive light and she never sells it the way she should sell it. And she always sells it short and sells herself short. And uh, so I was like, a guy said that to you at a party? And she's like, yeah. And I go, well, who, who was this guy? And she's like, oh, just some guy. And it was a party at my house and someone brought him and he was kind of cute, but I was talking to him, you know, it was friendly, we had some drinks. And, uh, and I go, well, what was his name? And she's like, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know his name. And I'm like, You're, you remember a guy, what he says, but not his name? Like, that's how much you think of that person. You don't even remember th their name, but you remember the negative thing they said to you, you know, because they probably felt awkward at a party, you know, next to someone interesting like you. You know, like, people n don't sell themselves, you know what I mean? And that was the other thing. Tell you who bothers me when I go out at night. Guys. I want to grab him by the shirt and smack him with an open hand like a fucking bitch. Because I watch guys trying to pick up women and it drives me crazy. I see guys trying to run their little fake game and it drives me crazy. I should be that guy that women should not see. That just goes up to guys and smacks them and says, get your shit together. Tell her about this and she'll suck your dick. You're talking, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. but women don't see me. Like, I just come up to them, smack them, and go get it together. You're acting like a fucking faggot. Bam! Smack them again. Get it together. Tell them how big your dick is. You're over there talking about stocks and bonds and fucking Herman Cain. Does that really work for you, Joey, though? Does What's it that? really? What's that? <laughs> Telling women about big dicks? Is that? I don't think that works. Listen, Felicia, we had this discussion a couple weeks ago, and a lot of guys email me back on this. And I thought about this. This was tested and seen. When I ran with guys, I had, I had four guys that I ran with. Our goal was to go out and get fucked up. None of us. I never had friends that hunted pussy. Like pukey ways, like in that gross guy way with uh -huh. the color on and off. Hi, ladies. That shit did not fly where I grew up. You had to just be yourself and whatever. And I had one guy that was a mediocre looking guy. That was Navajo, Indian, and Italian. So when he would drink, he would go off the deep end. But no matter how deep he went off the deep end, he always had a chick hanging on to his fucking dick. If you go to a woman and look her in the eye and tell her what you're looking and what you're feeling from her and what things you want to do to her and just leave it at that because the first man who talks loses. You know that. If I come up to you and say, Felicia Michaels, my name is Joey Diaz, here's the deal. I ain't good looking, but your fucking pussy is banging today, and your face with those little glasses is banging. 
That's all I got to say. I walk away. <laughs> Hold that's on, gonna, Joe. I just have to take a moment. <laughs> yes, that's going to eat you alive the rest of the night. How this fat pig. I am actually blushing. <laughs> how this fat pig came up to me and said those things to me. And I know you. You're going to get three of those Cosmos in you. And you're going to go, what gave you the right? Da, 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 da. And I'm just going to say, look, I was looking at you. And I think just from over the years that your pussy is perfect to those black little jeans. You know what I'm saying? And it's just <laughs> vibrating, throwing heat at me. I could sniff it from over here. Oh, no. And either you're going to like me or you're going to fucking hate me. But at least I'm, you're going to have an opinion. I'm going to sit there and dilly dally with you about, you know, who's your favorite president or your favorite... <laughs> Singer, oh, who gives a you fuck? Gotta do that a little no, bit. fuck you. <laughs> Listen, here's the deal you obviously washed your pussy and washed that ass to come out tonight. Oh, no. You got your three little stiff girlfriends, the fat ones watching you right here because oh, she don't want you to get laid. But I got what you're looking for, you know what I'm saying? And even if this don't click, I'm gonna suck your twat, I'm gonna lick your ass. So, over what do you think a time. person's success rate would be if they did this? 66 percent, 66 66 percent. So, wow, because wow. nobody talks to them like that. And you're being different. You're so, being different. So when, when have you taught, I'm sure since it's 66%, what about the other 44% of the time when the woman shot you down when you did You didn't that? want to do business with them anyway. <laughs> they weren't on your level anyway. Why are you wasting your fucking time? You blew them out of the fucking water. They got no sense of humor. If they turn you down, even if they said, that's pretty good guy, yeah, I got... Some women have a sense of fucking humor. Right. You follow me? So right there, they didn't get you. They don't want you want to do business with them anyway. Because somewhere along the line, there's going to be a, by the way, they don't suck dick. They want you to shave your balls. They don't like pubic hair. You know, there's always some drama. So you shook them right out of the water. There was no drama. You just, <laughs> ba-boom, pushed them right. The, we know where we stand with that fucking yeah. fat pig. Oh, <laughs> Oh it's God. crazy. It's crazy. I'd rather, no, I rather. Why would know. you want to bullshit somebody? I might have a problem. I'd rather tell a woman what's on my mind from the start. Look, let's cut this shit. You went out. You put the skirt on. You went to pay less shoes. You walked around for an hour looking for those new shoes. Obviously, you want to stab it. <laughs> let's cut this shit. You hear? No, look at you like what the fuck? I seen a black comic <laughs> one time that Jesus he's. I, I don't know if you know him. Who's the guy that robbed Betty Murphy? And then he robbed uh, P Puff Daddy's credit card in Vegas, and he got caught buying jewelry. I have no idea. There's a comic that, really? that's been around. He's in the first fucking Dr. Dre video walking on the phone, and uh -huh. he's a comic, and he's not a bad guy. Like uh, He sold out the Comedy Store Fat Tuesday with his side of the story on the Puff Daddy credit card that he didn't steal, and then supposedly years ago he robbed Eddie Murphy's watch. They were at a party at his house, supposedly. Really? So I seen this guy at the comedy store one night, right? He's a big, good-looking black dude. And he's outside the comedy store, and he's talking to two chicks. I'll never forget this. And he's looking. He's talking to the one girl. But as he's talking to the chick that he's going to leave with, there's a chick over by the sign where Kennison shot with the 22, mm -hmm. the sign that says comedy store. The girl goes inside to get a drink. This cool black guy walks over to the girl by the thing. He goes, listen, baby. You're my second choice. If this shit don't work out with the first one, it's me and you to the fucking wheels <laughs> fall off. And she sat there like a French poodle. And I looked at this guy and said, that is brilliant. But you know why he got that? Because he got honesty. If he wasn't honest, there's honor amongst thieves. He just told the bitch. The chick was right there. She seen him with or the woman. Or he's an asshole. Or he's a fucking asshole. Oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Yeah. That chick sat at attention the rest of the night, and she was a nine. Yeah, because she's like, she oh, was my a, God. She was a hot my little friend's boy. about to fuck a complete asshole. How no, do I she stop this? That's what she she's She sat thinking. there knowing that she was number. If I came up to you and said, you're looking pretty fucking hot tonight. Listen, I'm going to try to fuck that chick over there. But if shit don't work out, you're my number two on the list. You would hit me in the head with a bottle. Right. But you just blew out. Of on that rate, I think that's down to like 22%. You can never All right, but let me. Did he say this before they saw him on stage or after they saw I him on remember. stage? I don't remember. I don't remember. That's my now question. You got me. Now, you, now you got me there. Because <laughs> he did it after he got off stage. <coughs> Makes complete sense. <laughs> We're back, bitches. Be in the Beast podcast. Joey Diaz. My little beautiful Felicia Michaels with a black little tight corduroys on, looking good today. It's so weird how you go through different phases of your life uh, with comedy, and when and when you're at one point of comedy, when you're MC, when you're at that open mic MC, you still have your eight hour job, mm -hmm. you know, part time, 
Like, it was so weird that for me, like, I, I remember, like, if I go back to that time, it was Boulder in 94, and I was still, like, a part-time criminal. To, I was selling cars, but the hours were too long, so I'd quit, and then for a month, I'd sell coke, and then for, I'd get another little job in Boulder, and then for a month, I'd sell weed, or, and it was always, like, an option that was there, like, fuck, I could either go work in an office at night selling yeah. insurance on the phones. So, you had to do comedy just to go straight. Yeah, but but it was funny how, you know, every time, like, I had doubts with my comedy or I, I was having a bad month, you have to do something, you know, and sometimes it was catering. Like, when I moved to L.A., it was catering and, and whatever. But then I moved to L.A. Uh, after a few years of being in L.A., I met people, and I knew where to get an eight ball, and I knew where to get a quarter ounce. And sometimes, once a month, somebody would come to me and say, hey, man, where can we get a quarter ounce? Can you hook us up? And if I knew them from the comedy store or something, I'd get it from them and I'd make 60 bucks. I always knew. And I knew from looking at it if I could cut it or not, you know. And, and I was telling these guys the story. They created a big buzz. This week I got home and I got like 10 emails from people in Dallas that it was all over the thing. It was the Whitney Houston story. And I just uh -huh. wanted to tell you the story here. You know, and I didn't want people to think the wrong impression because when you're in those Joe Rogan podcasts, you have to tell your story quick. It's like combat oh, stories, so you really yeah, can't yeah, yeah, yeah. you really okay. can't give the people a backdrop. So I want to give the people yeah. a backdrop, and it's pretty nice that we don't have a guest right now till later on. So this is what's great about this, so we could tell the story. And and it was because Felicia was looking at me weird, like I've known Felicia for a long time, and, I, and three months ago I came in here, and Felicia, and I'm like Felicia, I'm out of stories. You know, I'm really out of stories, and then. Uh, I was going to meet Stanhope, and I was thinking about when the last time I seen Stanhope was. And I was thinking about that he had, he lived on the top floor of this building, and he had two chicks that lived in one apartment and another chick that lived next to him. And they were, all three of them were pretty cute. And the one girl was German, uh -huh. tall, like she even had a little bit of an accent very lightly. She had grown up in Vermont or something. And one night I bumped into her at the Seven okay. Eleven. She grew up in Vermont, so she was like Americanized. Her I'm sorry, and uh, <laughs> like I don't fucking know, right? So I seen her at the Seven Eleven on Curson, yeah. and ended up going home with her and doing like a gram. And I didn't think she was gonna give it up, and she finally gave me the monkey at like six. And I went home. I had over almost explained. I never seen her again. Mm -hmm. But then there was a redhead chick that lived next door to them. That her car got hit, and I was nice to her one night, and she was really beautiful. And voluptuous, big tits, the whole fucking deal. But she weighed like 160. She had a big ass, but she was thick, but she was like 23. She was really hot. She would come to the comedy store with dates. And one night she came to the comedy store another date, and I ended up going home with her. We messed around. And then we had like this thing on Sundays that we'd mess around. And we'd do heroin, and we'd do uh, MDMH, the shit you put in water. And she'd come to the store on Sundays. I was the house MC. Mm -hmm. And I'd host from. MDMH is that? That shit that you put in water, and you drink it, and you fucking get like a quaalude, and you could die from it, you pass out. She would mix it in a water thing and go up to the store and give me oh, sips shit. in between my sets, and I would be fucked up. This is way before Terry. So I was thinking about. Jesus I was Jerry. thinking about how her and I had this weird relationship like I would hook up with her for two months in a row on Sundays then I wouldn't see her for six months like I go on the road and I lose contact with her and then I would and you know I would see her for two more months and every time I see her it got worse and worse I go over there she put lingerie on and we'd eat Valiums and snort heroin and blow and watch porn which I fucking you know like this all came to me like on the drive up to 134 mm -hmm. and I was thinking about, oh my god what about when I was selling coke to Whitney Houston and I'm like, oh, my God, that was the most fucked up time. Because, again, at the time I was living with Terry, I had just met Terry. Okay. This is what's amazing about Joey Diaz. Because, in your opinion, the time you sold that to Whitney Houston is story number 2,556. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it you was nothing. that would be, like, in the top ten. No, it was nothing to me. It was yeah. nothing to me. Because I've been around people. Everybody you meet has partied with a celebrity. And when they say it in a circle, it always seems uncomfortable. Like, so I never really remembered. It wasn't like I party with Whitney Houston. So it was like we just had a drug relationship. And it wasn't really Whitney Houston. It was her road manager. So it was the weirdest thing because at that time I was getting $15 a spot at the store. You know, if you got a main room spot, woo, you know, it was like 80 bucks or 90 And I was basically living off road gigs that paid nothing as a feature act in San Diego or Bakersfield or all those $100 gigs and I always had a bummer ride or it was a fucking nightmare. I don't have to tell you, you know, when you're first yeah, starting yeah, out. Yeah, no, yeah, and nice, instead yeah. of, and a lot of comics hustle, my part-time gig was selling drugs to people from time to time. 
So one day I would buy weed on Curson Street, uh -huh. and I was good friends with him. He was a comic, but he worked at CAA for a while in the main room. And he quit and became a comedian, but one of the guys he worked with was this guy that became a road manager to music acts. Mm -hmm. And this has to be 2000, because I met, or 2001, because I met, I started hooking up with Terry in 2000. And like in that New Year's or something, she found a dollar bill rolled up. And she asked me, what is this? And I told her, and she goes, listen, I can't date you if you do this shit in the house, or don't, don't. So I said, fine. So I was good for about a month, but then old habits die hard. And I just made a deal with myself. I can't do coke in the house. I could do it in the car and then go up and hopefully she'll be asleep and I won't let none of her friends see me do it. And I was pretty good with that shit, you know. I would never do it at the store. I would always do it on, in the car on the way home. That's my freak. I would do it at a fucking light. I'd just put a dollar bill and, and do a blast at the light and just keep driving. But this thing came up. He kept asking me, you know, can you help out my friend? And I'm like, when people ask you to help their friend out, they got to be a cop. And that's why I didn't want to meet the guy. But finally, I said, you know, all right, what does he want to buy? He goes, I don't know cocaine. He just wants to buy big numbers. So I needed money, so I started helping the guy. And after like two or three times, the guy told me what he did. You know, we became, he was from Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And we became friends, and what he did, and he told me that he was Whitney's and Bobby's, well, Whitney's road manager, and he traveled with them, and he was uh, getting packages for them. And he would call me every fucking day, and at the time, I was getting coke at Martel. And it was called the Martel Cartel. And they had, like, street coke. And I cut a deal with them. I'm like, guys, you can't sell me this shit. I want this shit. You guys get uncut. I'll pay you a little extra for it, and I'll cut it. So I would get inositol. And it was like I would go to the health food store and buy a fucking barrel of inositol and leave it at my house. And I would get, like, an eight ball by eye, put it in my baggie. The guy would pick me up in front of my house, take me to the Martel cartel. In the guy's house, I would throw the cut in and take my eight ball out and give the guy the coke, and he'd drive me home. That's it, Felicia Michaels. And I would get like 200 bucks and an eight ball for the day. So you were a drug dealer. So I was a drug dealer, yeah. pretty much, just for them. And I was taking some coke and snorting it. But they were coming to me every day. I couldn't snort that much fucking blow. I had too many people around me. So I, I didn't want to have it at the house. I hid it in the garage for a few weeks. And finally I go, Marilyn, can you hold this for me in the house? And I went to my friend's house and I weighed up like an ounce and I gave it to him. And I gave it to her. And then I weighed up another half ounce and gave it to her again. And I think I gave her like a half and a quarter and an, an ounce. And I gave it to her because I kept, it kept coming in. So I would just leave some in the garage and snort that. And finally one day I said, you know what, Marilyn, bring the bunch down because I think I'm going to sell it. What a fucking mistake that was. I had all this coke, but I didn't have it in the house. I had it in the trunk of the car. And every time I, and I went to the store and I had a good set. So as I was walking off stage, some guy gave me a little baggie with something on the bottom of it, Felicia Michaels. And I went to the house and I did it and it wasn't coke, it was speed. So it fucked me up. So I kept going in and out of my apartment to the trunk of the car on, in front of that house where we lived on Schrader and doing cocaine in the car. It was fucking crazy. And at five o'clock, that redheaded chick paged me one night and she's like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. And I went over to a house and we fucking stayed there till five in the afternoon. And that's what made me, it was just horrible. We did heroin, <coughs> we did the fucking wow. ounce and a half of blow. In that whole fucking time, I felt terrible about myself. And that, and that was when I really, I started signing up and going to like these little rehab classes. I wouldn't tell nobody. But that's when all that stuff with Whitney Houston was going. And it's so weird that I told the story. People know the story because they've heard it. And it's so weird that people are trying to blow it up. That people never take like uh, the good things about that you've done. Like they took that story out of all of them. That's the one that really made a difference. All the podcasts we do. Mm -hmm all the shit that I take from and it's really weird one of the other reasons why I never told that story and it's, it's weird like I told you the story like if you said to me what are the embarrassing things in your life Joey and I'm like when I stole that fucking kid's jar from that Carvel you know what I'm saying yeah. and it's so weird how that dealing with her on that level like I didn't see her until like the 10th time that he brought her in the car and she didn't really talk to me you know she said hello I said hello but I remember looking at her and how she was looking outside the window and how bad she felt that she was in the car with me and how fat I felt that I was in the car with her because this wow. is the way I wanted to really meet yeah. her. And it was weird because I remember going to people's houses to get coke when I was already fucked up. And they'd, like, I'd call you up or whoever. I'd call somebody up and go, hey, I want to get a pack. And they go, well, I'm at my sister-in-law's house. And I would go there, and these people would go, you're the guy from the longest yard. And I'm in a fucking way, Felicia, that I can't talk to people. 
and here I am to buy coke, and they're looking at me as a guy in the movies, and I'm really going there in my lowest point. So I always thought about, like, the last time I seen those people was the story I told on the podcast with, with uh, Whitney Houston that they were here for the Grammys or the American Music Awards or something, and the kid had called me all week. He's like, bro, this week they're partying hard, so you got to be on fucking call. When they call, they want a package, you know? But I remember that they didn't call the night of the awards, and I was really in shock. I'm like, I was getting ready to snort blow. I didn't have any money. I was living off them, you know? And they didn't call, but the next morning they called. Like at 7 in the morning, and they goes, your guy ready? I'm like, yeah, he's fucking ready. Let's go. And they picked me up. And I remember that they were all still up from the night before, you know? And they were looking out their perspective windows as we drove to get it, and I gave it to them. And I remember when I got back in the, in the house that day, it was like 8 in the morning, and I hid the eight ball in the garage. I remember going upstairs and thinking about how bad they felt. Like that they had a, this is like the murky waters in the end of the world. These people got invited to the fucking Grammys. These people are Grammy type fucking people, you know. So it's just really sad that that's what I learned from that experience. And that's why I never, I think I never talked about it. Because that's more embarrassing to me than stealing that fucking change jar. Like even for me going to, like I said, to, 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 to the ghetto, the cop. And somebody would say, you're the guy from the longest yard. And I, yeah. You know how fucking embarrassing that was, you know? Like, yeah. So I'd never, it, like, to so some people, it's like, you're right. It's like story one for some people. For me, it's like story 2000 and whatever because, you know, I don't even know. I, that's the way I was raised. Just watch, shut your mouth, and listen, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, seeing Lawrence Taylor years ago, 30 years ago, and trying to offer him a bump of coke and him wanting to beat me up at a bar in Jersey one night. Like, he's like, get the fuck out of here before I kill you, you white motherfucker and all this shit. So, mm -hmm. but it's just weird. Like, I've been thinking a lot about that story lately and it's like, first off, I shouldn't have said it because it created too much drama in a way. Why? Well, I, I didn't think that people would react to it that way. I thought it was just a story I was telling that. To me, like I said, Everybody I've met has always said, oh, well, I party with this guy or I party with that guy or <clears throat> this guy did coke with me or whatever. So, I don't know. It just well, felt you know, like Joey, a minute story. Here's the thing, like, uh, we're pretty honest about everything on this podcast. I think so. And uh, uh, everybody knows, if, if this is just the first time you've listened to this podcast, you know, I don't know what you're going to take away from it. But if you've li listened to the podcast and listened to all your stories, and listened to the things in between the stories about what you're saying about how it shaped you as a person. You know that when you I think when you tell stories like that, you know, they're funny because you're a funny person, but that that was that was part of your story too and you're allowed to tell that part of the story and I don't think you should be penalized or think badly of because it made you a better person. That story made you a better person. Don't you think that was one of the Steps in, I got to get my shit together because that's fine. It was a Monday morning, and yeah. I remember going upstairs and going, these people are getting high on a Monday morning. That's the day. That was the day that I really noticed that she was looking out the window, and it was like she was embarrassed to be there. Yeah, and that's saying it in that way. Also, look, everybody knows that something's going on or did go on or whatever happened with her and, and drugs or whatever. And I think that pa paints her in a very gentle light because it's an addiction. It's an illness. It's when you're at that fucking point, you are ill. You know. You know. It's an addiction, and it's that's uh, now that you're talking about it in that light. Here's you know? the real addiction. Here's where it gets weird. Before a person goes to rehab or they hit their bottom or whatever the fuck they want to call it. There's one morning that you have to wake up and you open up your eyes and you look at the ceiling and you like, where the fuck am I? And you think about the night before and you know that you can't keep doing this. It's so weird, Felicia, because you know you can't keep fucking doing this, but you can't stop. You can't fucking stop. And that's where it gets really scary. And that's the position I was. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, I was done with cocaine in 95. I did it till 2007 because I couldn't stop. And that's the scary thing. That's the sad part to me, that even knowing you're a fucking award-winning Grammy artist or an athlete or a fucking president or whatever the people, whatever the fame you might have, that you're lurking in that bottom floor of life. You're on the basement of life, and in reality, you're in the penthouse of life. But you're forcing yourself to go down. I felt it all the fucking time, and I'm nobody. I was on the second floor. 
and I would just go in the basement. I would fucking feel terrible about myself, even thinking about it. Like all week, I've been thinking about it. Like how sad is that fucking story? I had a cookie party Saturday. I am now uh, to a thirty of my best closest girlfriends. Officially a cookie Nazi. You are. I heard you were a cookie Nazi. I get to, Nobody I get, touched the cookies. And, and I shit. got called out on it because there's this one mom. I'm just going to say her name. Her name is Sabrina. And Sabrina is a beautiful girl, right? And Sabrina, I, she was a waitress at the Laugh Factory when I used to play the Laugh Factory years and years ago when she was wow. like 19 or 20 years old, right? And so our kids went to the same school, and she's friends with my friend Wendy, and, and uh, she's just gorgeous, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so she never bakes. That bitch never bakes. Like, I don't know why Wendy invites her. A lovely woman, and I love her children, but the bitch never bakes, you know? And then after the party, I, we pack them all up, and we give uh, you know each person a little gift of cookies, and everyone automatically gets a little bag, whether you bake or you not bake. Mm -hmm. But the girls that bake, you know, I'm gonna hook those bitches up, right? So then Sabrina's like, here's your, you know, I give her the little bag, and then she looks at me, and there's like, there's like this tension building, right? And uh, cause she saw that I gave someone else two bags and, or another box. And she's like, you know, I, I did roll a few cookies, you know, like in a little balls. <laughs> I said, <laughs> what? what? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I, you know, at least 10 of them. And then I was like, oh, all right. So I give her another box of cookies. And then she's standing there, right? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, well, you know, I have kids. And I'm on inside, Joe. You know, I'm like, what the bitch, fuck? You didn't yeah. bake. You didn't do shit. You know what I mean? You should have thought about this. I know. And then after the party, another friend of mine called and said, listen, I witnessed that whole thing, and it was so uncomfortable. I had to leave the room. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Like, oh. The war over fucking cookies. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You see what cookies? You see what cookies? Well, Terry uh, got me a box of those cookies, the white box, and they were oh, really good. good. I ate right? them. Yeah, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, we <laughs> the ate them. We ate them that night. Yeah. Fuck yeah. No, they were yeah. great cookies, man. But it's weird when... You bake something and somebody else comes and takes half your shit. And you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can and just I, imagine. And I squirrel away some for me and then for the activity partner and then for Wendy, you know, because we're all throwing the party together. But what anyway. else is going on? You're getting ready for the holidays? You got the boys I am. and shit? I'm getting ready for the holidays and uh, uh, working on some uh, technical stuff for a surprise that we have coming up. Now, let me ask you this. Are you, do the boys believe in Santa Claus or? They don't, they don't give a Frenchman's no, fuck about Santa no, Claus. They gave that up about Do we two have years to take ago. them for a ride and then put the tree, the kid, toys into the tree, then yeah. bring them back? Wow, what, look what happened. Santa showed up. Well, you know what happened is uh, at Easter time a few years ago, my little one said, uh, Mom, there is no Easter bunny. I said, What? How do you know? And he's like, I looked it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Was like, I was like, that. well, now, now you know everything. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that fucking computer has ruined more fucking things. Yep. Because it's always nice as a kid to, even if you know Santa don't exist, like just to be tricked mm -hmm. into that there's a doubt. Because all you got to do is give me a reasonable doubt, and I just put it away. I say, fuck it. It didn't matter whether there is or there isn't. I got a GI Joe. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't give a fuck. At first, you're a little baffled. Like, wait a second. I, I've been with mom all fucking day. How did she sneak these toys into the house? You follow me? Yeah, yeah. So even if you know, it's always great as a mom to right. play a fucking trick on these little cocksuckers. Yep. Just to let them know you got the upper hand because, yeah, you might know, but really, you think you know about Santa? Now you fuck them up till they're like 17. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So like a yeah. senior in high school, they're all fucked. I don't know about that, though. Well, I remember looking for presents when I was a little girl, and I found them behind that my parents had like a bar, like how I have in here, a little 60s bar or whatever, and it was pushed up against the wall, and the presents were in there. And I remember finding it and, and feeling like the smartest, saddest little girl in the world. Sure. Oh. Sure. <laughs> You know, it has been wonderful for us to have guests. I look forward to the guests every week. Every and, week. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'm all like, I want to know who's coming, exactly all the information, because I want to Google everything. And I have a million questions. And then sometimes I just trust you. And uh, today's guest is quite lovely. Well, here's the fucking deal. I've been friends with Eddie for a long time, and, and, I, and he calls me one night, because whenever I do comedy and I'm out late, I always call Eddie to see where he is. Cause Eddie could be at any part of the city at any time. This is Eddie Bravo. Yeah, and he, you do know that. Eddie could be at anywhere at any fucking time. Don't ever underestimate the power of Eddie Bravo. If you're landing in Michigan, call fucking Eddie because he <laughs> might be close by for a fucking seminar. 
And Eddie will take a fucking bus and hang with you. He's done it in Denver. I've seen yeah. Eddie show up. He was in awesome. a seminar at four. So whenever I come home, I'm driving home at night. And you, you know when you do comedy, Felicia, and you're driving home? It just defeats the purpose to come home to yourself. Because your head's going to fucking blow up, if, especially if you killed. Right, especially right. if you killed and you got to talk to somebody. Eddie's that guy. So I would call Eddie and Eddie answers. He's like, I'm an El Compadre. And on Monday, that's why I took you that night on Monday nights. Oh, that's right. Because that's yeah. a tradition. On Monday nights, we go to El Compadre, we go to Tamale. That's it. You eat a half a bag of the chips and whatever. And one night he shows up with Lex, you know, and I'm like, wow, this girl. But it wasn't <laughs> like we did a karate video the first time yeah. we met. We talked about movies. We liked the same movies. I called him the next morning. I'm like, I like this fucking one, Eddie. I like it, bro. He's like, oh, no, I'm just teaching her jiu-jitsu, you know, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> playing whatever, <laughs> bitch. She's got a hook in your ass, you know what I'm saying? And, and when we were looking for guests, I thought, who would be more interesting than a, a, a porn girl that mm -hmm. became a, is becoming a mom? And to me, that blows my fucking heart apart because both of these, one was in Playboy, the other one was in whatever, Penthouse, and you're both going to be fucking hot moms. Like, when I was a kid, didn't, there was no moms that looked like you fucking to. If to look uh, like you two, you were bar chicks. You know what I'm saying? You're you, so sweet to include me on her list I'm, I'm she that's, is quite delicious. Both of you are fucking Jeez. beautiful, but I just wanted to know the experience of, of what. First of all, just Lex Luthor, ladies and gentlemen. What the fuck? Yay, Lex Cassidy, a.k.a. Guys. Lex Bravo, <laughs> a.k.a. Lex Bakersfield, whatever. Got a million names. What's happening, beautiful? Not much. Trust me, I'm still in shock about this whole situation. <laughs> you want to know what's going on? It's just, it's crazy. I can imagine what's going through Eddie's head. <laughs> I think he's still in shock. Well, uh, the guys, like I told you, the guys, it's like, I'm having a baby in nine months. Nine months, Felicia, is like 10 years. And yeah, guy years. Yeah, That's yeah. what we feel like. Mm -hmm. Nine months to us? Three months. Ah, fuck it. You know? Yep. Two months. And like I told you, Eddie, wake up. The water broke. What? What what are you talking about? My fucking water broke. We gotta get to the hospital. And that's when it becomes real. It's like yep. you what was the line you said the other night? Um, that a woman becomes a mother when she finds out she's pregnant and then a guy becomes a father when he first sees his child. Yeah. That's oh it. yeah. Definite reality. Yeah. yeah. But poor Eddie, when I first told him he kept trying to get me to pee on sticks, he's like, I don't know, I don't believe this. Okay, so then I peed on like four sticks. I'm like, all right, they're all positive. So we go to the doctor and we do um, an ultrasound and the doctor's like, okay, here's the embryo, here's the sac, pointing it out. And Eddie's just sitting there with his mouth open. He looks at the doctor. He's like, is she, so is she really pregnant? Is, is that real? Is she really pregnant? <laughs> just in denial. Wow. <laughs> it, was, awesome. it was hilarious. It was really funny. Poor guy. <laughs> and how are you feeling now? Like he was saying that you're three months away and you're fucking, uh, you know. Yeah, it's going by, um, well, for Eddie, it's going by quick. For me, it's going by extremely slow. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting there. I just can't wait to get it over and done with. <laughs> I'm tired of being sick and tired and not being able to do the things that I used to do. It's, it's a whole shock, you know, like one moment you're living your life for yourself and the next moment you're living your life for something that you haven't even met yet. Well, let's backtrack a little bit because I uh, just met you and I have questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, are, you are a porn star. Yes. Yeah, and I mean that with great love and respect. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I, I didn't do comedy for a long time, I took a hiatus, like a nine-year hiatus, and during that period I worked for a, a photographer, Michael Greco, mm -hmm. and he went down into Vegas where they do the big award show and he made a coffee table book of porn stars. It's a really beautiful book. He's an amazing photographer. And uh, I got to go and be like the camera assistant. Nice. And, uh, and I had to go and pull the girls off uh, the floor, you know, to come and get their picture. And, and uh, it was uh, the most amazing experience and it really changed my view on uh, girls in the pornography business. And this is from a person that was in Playboy. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like I totally never had a problem with it. But, but when you're talking about porn movies you know like there is that little weirdness about it in a sense and then I had to be a around all these people for a week and I really enjoyed it you know <laughs> what I mean like you got to really see uh, a different side of the business you know some mm -hmm. of it was a little awkward yeah and kind of ugly and, right. and then mm -hmm. some of it was like whoa Jenna Jameson it was like when she came in the room it was like Oprah arrived you know what I right, mean right like, everyone stops so, yeah it was <laughs> a really cool thing and uh and uh so I would like to know your journey and how you quickly if you could mm -hmm. got into pornography how did how did that come about for you um it's kind of a funny story I used to be married and my ex-husband was in the marine corps and one day he asked me he's like will you please send me some naked pictures 
I said, okay. So I knew a photographer through a friend. I got that photographer to take pictures of me and we're looking at him. We're like, holy shit, these are pretty good. He's like, yeah, what do you want to do with them? I'm like, well, I'm supposed to send them to my husband, but I don't know if I want to now. So I scanned them, put them on the internet and I just started working. I don't know, it just happened within a day. Just taking those pictures, I never sent them to my ex-husband. <laughs> and um, I just started working. Like I started throwing them up on OMP and Model Mayhem and that was it. I mean, my first year in the industry, I worked almost every single day. It was nuts. Wow. Yeah, and then I got divorced shortly after that. <laughs> wow. <Well, you know. laughs> Most people can't hang with that. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I just I started out doing... Um, like all Playboy style modeling, just nude modeling, that's it. And then it became more progressive into me signing a contract with Vivid. So I was just doing girl, girl. And that's been the like the extent of me in the industry is just girl, girl. Nothing uh -huh. crazy like boy, girl or anything. Wow. Yeah. So for seven years, up till six months ago, I was in the adult industry. And I so, loved it. It was amazing. So then let me ask you this. At, at any time, did you think as you were doing that and uh, did you think... Uh, wow, one day I might, I might be a mom and this could be sticky. Um, yeah, because the whole time I've been wanting kids since I was 18. So I knew that that day was going to come. But on the other hand, I don't, I'm not afraid of it because, you know, like one day when my kids ask, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to throw it in their face. But, you know, I'm just, I'm not afraid of it because I don't feel like I've done anything wrong. So, you know, I got to be upfront and honest, but I don't think there's going to be any negative backlash from it you know, right. from my kids so do you stopped working six months ago yes and uh, 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 were you scared when you found out um, yeah <laughs> I was definitely afraid um, in shock for a while and then you know Eddie got home and I couldn't even tell him like the words would not come out of my mouth because it just seemed so unrealistic for me telling him that I was pregnant so it took a little while and then I finally told him and once I said it out loud then it became more realistic yeah. So. And if I'm impolite, uh, please excuse me, you know, because sometimes I'm not the most tactful person as giving my nickname Cookie Nazi. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, are you going to continue your career after you have the baby? Is that wrong to uh, not assume it or assume it, you know? Like? No, some, some girls do because I have um, a lot of friends in the industry that have kids and they continued working afterwards and then some have retired. Mm -hmm. So everyone, you know, does it differently. I don't really know exactly what I'll do. More than likely I'll stop, you know, because mm -hmm. I've kind of closed that chapter of my life. Oh, wow, okay. But, yeah, so I'm just, I'm looking forward to being a full-time mom. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Very cool. You know, one of the yeah. highlights of this show was, uh, that I'll never forget, was Felicia. And I told you the other day, coming on the show and telling me that one day her kids are going to find out and they're going to ask you. And the day came and, you know, he asked Felicia. And Felicia said she stopped for a second. And then he goes, you know, really, Ma, you were in Playboy? Is that true that that's where the world's prettiest women are in Playboy? And Aww. that everything turned around. And every time I think of that, it destroys me. Like, I'm like, that <laughs> is the greatest thing. Mm -hmm. A boy could say to his mom, you know, mom, right. what the fuck? Well, there was, there's been a cultural shift, you know, like uh, when I did uh, Playboy, it was at, at the end of where you were kind of stigmatized for it. And now that it's been a cultural shift, I think, you know, because everyone is much more into porn and it's around us more and we're savvy about it right. and it's a business. It's more accepted. And, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, but the fact that he knew that Playboy was, was a good thing, you know what I mean? Where beautiful women were. And that's, that's always surprising, you know? I know. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good story. That's a great story to me. Mm -hmm. So are you having a boy or girl or you don't want to know? Or? Nope. I'm having a boy. You're having a boy. I'm having oh. a boy. I found out when I was two and a half months. So okay. that's what I was rooting for the whole time. Yeah. And Eddie was rooting against me. He wanted a girl. But I th he said afterwards that he only said he wanted a girl just because he didn't want to jinx it and he wanted a boy really bad. Uh -huh. So it's good that we both wanted a boy. Right. Oh, and I don't really sweet. have, like, a drive to have a girl, I don't yeah. think. You know, I'm not one of those girls that's like, oh, I have to have a girl so I can dress her up and put makeup on her. 
I'm no, because you already like did that. that. You already did that. Yeah. You know, that's how I feel. Like I'm so lucky. I have boys because, first of all, boys love their moms. Mm-hmm. Boys love their mamas. Yep. And if you had a girl, like all my friends who have girls, like 13 year old girls, are like those fucking bitches. You know, I have a girlfriend <laughs> who's a comedian. I think I spoke about this, and I just saw her. I hadn't seen her for years, and she has a 13 year old girl. And she was on stage, and literally the first thing she says is, "I, I have a 13 year old cunt living in my house," or something oh horrific. My and I was gosh. like, even I who could will say anything was like uh, you know what I mean like that's uh, so we're lucky you're gonna be well, lucky why are you me, looking forward boys. to having a boy if I could ask um cause me myself I've never really been too much into girly things up until six months ago I was in competitive powerlifting for seven years um I met Eddie doing jujitsu and then I trained Muay Thai for four years so I'm definitely more into the boyish things so I can see myself and my son when he's four years old and me putting him in wrestling. It's like, you got to start in wrestling. So I'll be the mom that's like outside rolling around with her son in the dirt, you know, like definitely pushing them more towards that aspect. Like, I just like the boyish things. I don't like the girly stuff. When I first met you, I seen the truck. Yep. I was like, she's got a, a truck, truck, you know, big old truck. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, she's just, yeah, it's pretty uh, neat. And I, I could see it when I talked to Eddie and you. And, mm-hmm. and you guys are going to be great parents. I mean, you're just into it, you know. But yep. this is basically about you. I'm still blown away, Lex. I'm still blown away that, you know, I talk to Eddie every couple of days. I talk to him every day, and I can mm-hmm. see the change in him. And I love it. To me, I love when a guy gets absorbed by a woman. And I like seeing the evolution of it. I love it. I love talking to a guy in the second week they're dating and going, Doug, you're fucking history. And them looking at me going, what are you talking about, Doug? I got this under control. Ain't nothing going to happen here. Right. And so, bam. You, you know, and I've christened you and I've christened Joe Rogan's wife. Mm-hmm. Like Joe showed up with her at the comedy store and they were there like a year. And, right. you know, and I walk out and I see Mrs. Rogan a foot taller than Joe, you know, and I walk out, <laughs> she's got the heels on. And I go, Mrs. Rogan, like I see Joe's face just drop. And she's like, uh uh-huh, she's just smiled, you know. And, I, right. and he was like, bro, where'd, you, where'd that come from? I go, it's done. You're done. I see it already. You yep, brought it to the comedy too. store. It's over. You know what I'm saying? And I love seeing the evolution, even myself with Terry. Mm-hmm. Like the first time I went to Terry's, I'm like, this ain't going to work. This bitch is calling me red beans and rice and southern food and everything's deep fried. And all of a sudden, this thing just happens when a woman just hooks a guy. That it's just crazy. It's not, and I'm not talking about like through childbirth. Mm-hmm. I'm just talking about you know when you met your match. Right. And, and I've seen it with guys before, but I've seen it particularly with Eddie. And I'm like, for her to just shut Eddie's twister down, she's got to be <laughs> that bad of a bitch. You just shut it down. Like, you know, you just beat it down. Like, I love it. Yep. And he's happier. He looks healthy. He looks great. So, you know, I'm a true believer that behind every successful man, there's a fucking great woman. I've always believed that. It's in history. I don't give a fuck what anybody tells you. Mm-hmm. That's what softens it up. When I was a kid, I used to watch Bruce Lee. And here's this handsome, handsome guy. And if you look at Linda Lee, she ain't the best looking woman in the fucking world. But I read all the books and all the interviews and how people, would, she would calm him down. Like he would just be in a room fucking going nuts. And Linda Lee would walk in the room and just go, and this motherfucker would just get hypnotized, you know? <laughs> People that knew him were like, oh, yeah, you have no idea. When she walked in the room, he fucking shut down. Like, it's amazing to see. And it's not that we're scared of you guys. None. It's just that we found our match. Right. And it's a beautiful thing to see it from the outside, you know? And, that's, yeah, and now you're having a baby. Yep. God it's damn. Crazy. And now you're quitting what you were doing. And he's mm-hmm. changing his life around. And just to see it, you know, when I got my wife pregnant, when I was a kid, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I, I was trying to, I was trying to beat off that fucking whole spell that t- comes with the whole woman thing, but I guess you get to an age that even as a guy, you want to be saved, you know, and right. I'm happy that you came in and that you're running, making shit yep. run smoothly. That's what <laughs> women do, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, uh, let me ask you this then. So, um, is there anything that after having the baby and all that kind of stuff that maybe you want to pursue also because uh you must have a tremendous fan base you know you know um you mean just like with the industry wise like uh-huh. if i want to get into directing or anything like yeah that? or anything like it doesn't even have to mm-hmm. be uh, porn by any means but is there anything that you wanted to like when you were doing the porn that you that you wanted it to lead to you know um, well, I mean, I stopped going to college halfway through my junior year, and I was majoring in political science, so uh-huh. I could see myself probably starting up college again. 
Oh, nice. Yeah, so maybe something like that. Here's the thing I want you to know, because I know all moms, uh, when they first have a baby, they freak out like, my life is over, you know what I mean? I won't be able to go out. And the, the thing is, uh, your life does change, but it changes in a way you would have never guessed, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, because uh, you're, you're, all you're thinking is you're chained to this, you know, situation. In a sense, you can't go out as much and do all that stuff. But the, the best moms and the happiest moms uh, just take those babies with them, you know? Yeah. Well, just to see motherhood from the other side like you could see even like i was at the y today and i could see the young girls that have kids you Mm -hmm. know how they act and some of them are goofy but they have a different uh shine to them right and like the other i was looking at you you look beautiful i could tell you're (laughs) pregnant but you just you're just fucking it's just coming out of you you know you're just raving like your energy you are pretty radiant yeah you're very radiant you know and (laughs) And, and I love that. I love to see a pregnant. I think the hottest women are pregnant women. Nine months. When I used to live in Colorado, and I see those girls with Sorrells on, with warm ups and the gut hanging, I'm like, that bitch is banging. Look oh. at that woman going yeah, swimming. Going swimming. You know what I'm saying? With me at seven in the morning, I would look at them going, the boy. It's so sexy to see a woman with the stomach that don't give a fuck. Like, I'm here, bitch. You know what I'm saying? She would come in a little one-piece bikini. There's one mom in particular. Jesus. And i just sit next to her in the <laughs> pool and go, you are a bad, you are so bad that half these guys <laughs> in this pool want to jump on you. That's how sexy you are. Just came in here in a room full of guys, jumped to the fucking pool. And it's a, to me, it's so sexy to see a mom. Like, whether it's, in like, when I see a mom in the first year, the baby's like a, a year, mm-hmm. moms are the hottest. You see them at the little farmer's market with the little outfits on and shit. They're so fucking hot. Moms are just hotter. And when you and I always thought this, even when I was 20, I would look at a mom and go, that bitch be banging. Look at <laughs> it. Just because she's got that little kid on the show don't mean nothing. You take that kid away for three minutes, that bitch will rock your world. You know what I'm saying? But it's just something <laughs> about her. <laughs> Do you understand that? I, don't, I hear guys say that, how they think that pregnant women are hot. Oh, I my God. I do not think that hot, at all. Hot, I think it's pretty. I actually, hot, I, think so. hot. I think it's a base thing. Like, she just had a baby. That means she had sex. It means I might have a shot. I just exactly. think no, that's no. it. It's a, and the more outlandish the pregnant woman is, the more a guy gets turned on. Like if the woman has heels on, like let's say, I'm talking about a woman who's going to do something Mm -hmm. that is not acting like she's pregnant. Right. There's some women that you'll see them and they just love it. They'll hold this. It's like Dean Martin used to say, more than Jeannie, my wife likes to be pregnant because some women just love it. They hold it. Other women, that's just a situation that's going on in their lives. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know what? I'm still going to see fucking Biggie Smalls. I'm just gonna put a, I'm just gonna put a dress on and get two tickets. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So when you see a mom like that, and then you see him like you already know what they're gonna be as his moms. Like you know, I, I've told Felicia how many times I've been driving and see a woman in 90 degrees walking with a crib and another kid, and you're like, look at that woman, she's beautiful. That's, That's fucking so beautiful. sweet. Because from experience, I'm gonna tell you when you're carrying two babies. Oh please. And groceries. Sex and is the last thing yeah, on your you're, mind. You're just like, <laughs> but, God, I just want to go and be alone. And as Chris Rock would say, take a shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just amazing for a guy. Like, I grew up without a mom after like 15 years. And it's just, I respect momhood so much. Like, I have so much, so much respect for moms now afterward. You know, like mm-hmm. I was writing something this morning. And it was like the, the things that your mom, only your mom could teach you certain things. We have a certain story here that Felicia loves that I was at the gym one day and I might fucking cry right now. I was at the YMCA one day and I seen this little Hindu mom teaching her little boy how to box. Oh. Like just how to box, Jack. Yeah. You know, and at the end she's like, if you do this how I teach you, they'll never bother you in school again. This is mom. To say dad could have been out selling insurance or mm-hmm. at a fucking, you know, selling liquor at a store. Who knows? Right. But this is the things moms fucking do. Like mom got down and dirty. Mom said, fuck it. This is never going to happen to you again. Mm-hmm. I'm going to teach you how to fuck these motherfuckers up. Yeah. And I was crying. I was trying to ride my bike and I was crying. Like I was on, and at the Y, they have the punching bag and the mm-hmm. bikes. I was like crying. I mean, that is what it's all about. Mom finally said, this shit ain't happening no more. Right. You know what I'm saying? This shit ain't happening no more. We're going to go out and learn how to fucking do, do the hands. And that, to me, is the sexiest fucking thing in the world. And it's very endearing, you know? It's very, like, 
It gives you that faith in momhood. Moms right. are the shit, man. Yeah, it's amazing. She's taking matters into her own hands. Yeah, moms yeah. are what it's all about, bro. Yep. Uh, you remember whatever the, your mom tells you the, the rest of your life. You're the last stop. You're the last stop. No matter what happens, you know, the, the mom is the last stop. You got to... If something goes wrong in their, your kid's life to a certain point, you're responsible. You got to fix it. You know? <coughs> mm -hmm. Even when shitty stuff goes down, you got to teach them how to handle the shitty stuff. You know. You know, I remember being yeah. in the hospital, like when I was 14, and, and uh, I was giving my mom shit, like why I was there. And then one of her friends came to see me. And he goes, "Dog, you don't understand. Your mom cries all the way till she hits that door of that fucking hospital." And then she puts this fucking face on like a soldier. Mm -hmm. Don't break her balls. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't break her fucking Aww. balls. Yeah. And, wow. I th and I thought of that, you know, and that's the truth. Because she didn't want to see you. She didn't want it. She knew you could see it in her face if right. she was worried about you. So don't break her fucking balls. You know, she cries all day until she gets here. And then it's like a different story because she doesn't want you to feel weak. I mean, mm -hmm. we feed off our moms. Mm -hmm. It's so many fucking things, you know? Yeah. Well, still, even today, if I'm having a problem, I have to call my mom. There's nobody else that I want to talk to. I don't want to talk to Eddie. Like, that's my strong suit right there. Oh, so your mother. mom must be so excited, yeah. right? My mom and dad are really, really excited. Wow, is this going to be their first grandchild? Yep. Oh, neat. Yep, neat. so they're happy. <laughs> and you have one sister and one brother? Just one sister. One sister. Yep, one and sister. she doesn't have no kids yet. Nope, three years older than me. She knows of this shit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. See, I was lucky mm -hmm. my, my kids are adopted. Yeah. yeah, I heard yeah. about that. That's great. Yeah, I'm I'm a very lucky lady. There's and even when you adopt, awesome. you still fucking love oh, no, the same. It's, it's I mean, mental labor. It is. It's, it's, it's all, something it's all that uh, it's something that uh, it does. Your mom is always going to be your mom, man. Mm -hmm. You know that's the weirdest thing. That, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Fucking amazing. This is great that we had you on and shit. <laughs> um. So when are you due? I am due March 31st, but um, I'm doing a scheduled C-section, so it'll probably be a week before that. Oh, wow. Cut them okay. out. Get it over and done with. I don't want to go through labor. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Really? So you're just doing the C-section, that's mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Um, up until, I think it was like a week ago, Eddie was saying that he didn't want to be in the room with me because he can't handle blood. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll have my mom go in there with me. You know, like my mom. I need my mom. And now he's saying, like, okay, I'm going to go in there, but I'm just not going to look. I'm going to keep my eyes closed. So. <laughs> I fainted when my daughter was born. I fainted. Really? really? Fuck yeah. They had, when I woke up, they had those things you pop. Yeah, the like smelling salt. Norm, normally one could do. I had one in each nose. <laughs> That's how much I was passed out. Like, the doctors were like, this is, this is amazing. You won't get up. I had one in each Jeez. nose. And all, all, but I fainted, like, two or three times. I fainted for the epidural block. Like when I walk in the room and seeing her on all fours and the fucking needle coming out of her spine, mm -hmm. I fucking went down. Like then there was a little blood coming out from the sp like where the needle was in, I went down. <laughs> and then once I seen them stick the hand in, and they do something and they squeeze the needle, they squeeze the noodle out and they cut it with a scissor. That was it. I went down <laughs> after that. I went down. I went down. And it's fucked up because as a man, down. after you go down, you start looking for the stitches. What happened to these motherfucking stitches? They just disappear. But I actually seen him stick his hand in, go like this, and then pull out and cut like something. I was like, and I heard it go, and that was all. That was it right there. But boom, they had the baby, and then they woke me up. I laid there for like ten minutes, fucking just passed out with a oh ice pack on my God. head and shit. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a reason why you're gonna do a C-section or? Um, just, I hear so many horror stories from all my friends that have kids of ripping all the way to their asshole or their lips exploding because <laughs> there's too much pressure. I didn't think that was what gonna explodes? come out. <laughs> yeah. What explodes? Uh, like their lips, like they're just, their outside lips from too much blood pressure going down there and you know, they're not dilating right and I had a friend whose lips just blew open. I had two girls that started labor. They passed the head and couldn't pass the shoulder, so they pushed the baby back up inside and then did a C-section. It's like, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to go through, you know, 24 hours with the labor? Who knows how long it could be? Just five minutes. Give me a spinal block. No drugs. Touch my kid. Cut him out, and that's it. Done deal. You don't care about the stitches. Fuck it. Mm -mm. Little tattoo of Eddie's. I'll take the, the tiny man. scar. <laughs> yeah. <fuck laughs> I don't want my it. lips blowing up. <laughs>
That's my fear. <laughs> but you don't want to ruin that area. But don't the lips go, the, the swelling goes away afterwards? or? Well, my friend had to get a lot of stitches, but I mean, it was both of her lips that just blew up. So they do not look the same anymore. And I mean, that's that's rare that that happens. Yeah. But it's not really that rare that people rip and tear all the way through. <laughs> so you so. want to care for the monkey. Yeah. Even yeah. after the fact, take, fuck you it. You got to take everything. Just in case. You know what I'm saying? Just yeah. in case. Yeah. Just in case. case. It's got to look the same. Nothing's going to change down there. Yeah. <laughs> Rather take the tiny scar than ugh, push anything out of my badge. <laughs> Fucking hell. Really? Happen. Really? Yeah, I can't do it. I have a fear, and I've watched all the documentaries, like the business of being born and, you know, having a midwife. Nope. Watch Ricky Lake have her child. Nope. Can't do it. <laughs> all right. Nothing's coming out down there. You know, it, I, like when, when, <laughs> when, when my wife. Uh, it is not an tired. entrance only. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, when, when my wife had the baby, listen, I, I wasn't ready for it at all. I was 24. I was still slinging coke. You know, I was still mugging people. It was just a day in my life, like, you know. But I remember even trying to take it sacred. Like, I remember being in the room going, trying to take it sacred. And I fucking couldn't. Just because there's so much shit going on with tubes and needles and shit. Mm -hmm. Like, I just thought you went down there and you just opened your legs and pushed. And a taxi driver came and helped you. You know, push, (laughs) push, and that's it. You know, it's amazing. Like, and my wife, we were in Boulder, Colorado. The foo-foo capital of the nation at that time. So where she first went, she went to a hotel across from Boulder. Medical was like, you know. It was like a ho- like a fucking hotel, like a Four Seasons where they give you back rubs and they're burning like fucking incense and shit. But I think after the first pain of the monkey, fuck that. She tapped out and said, take me to the, and across the street for the epidermal. I swear to God. Oh, so she did. She wanted a midwife. She was going to give birth at home. Yeah, yeah. she was going no, to give gonna birth at this little shack in Boulder mm-hmm. where they play Hindu music and everybody jumps up and down. That shit lasted about 18 <laughs> fucking minutes. Though. Right. I got a little bell. She's like, dog, we're out of here. We're going across the street. Fuck it. Give the guy 100. We're out of here, dog. It's, it's too much tofu in this motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All that tofu, this woman's fucking red in the face. She's in pain. She ain't going to go for this shit. Well, you know, I have this girlfriend who had a baby, and she uh, wanted me to go photograph her giving birth at Cedar Sinai, and uh, and she had a, a the person that massages you. What is that? Doula. A doula. Yeah. And she had a doula, and uh, I swear to God, she did not make one sound while giving birth. Huh. Did she do any kind of hypnotherapy type thing? Because a lot of women do that. No, she was just super focused. Now, what's a doula? A doula is not a midwife. A midwife is experienced, they're registered nurses, but a doula is like a second hand to a midwife. So, you know, they take care of whatever you need. They calm you down. They massage you. They massage they do you. Just whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. Like I should give a doula. Yes, you need a doula. Need a doula myself. <laughs> Next time you need to take a tremendous shit, we'll come, call you a doula. No shit. Just a massage while you're typing and she'll shit. She'll come rub your back while you're straining. That's a good name for it. A doula. Just can't be like I a think fucking that's what helper. Called, right? Yeah, it's a doula. Yeah. 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 No, nope, it just can't be like a helper. You nope. gotta give it all this fucking name, a doula. You gotta church it up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point, Joey. <laughs> I hate that shit. It just can't be a fucking secretary, an yeah. executive assistant to the fucking. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Wait, so how did the, you, did you take the... I took the pictures, and uh, they were some one of the best pictures I, I ever took. It was a really cool experience, because my kids are adopted, so she said, hey, it was her second baby, so she kind of knew the drill, right? And mm-hmm. she's like, because I had said to her one time, you know, God, the one thing I will miss having adopted kids is just having the experience of giving life, just having that experience, you know? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and she said, uh, you know, you said that to me, and I've been thinking. And she said, when well, she was about seven months pregnant, that when I have the baby, I want you to be, you know, one of the people there, and I want you to take pictures, and I want you to experience it. Oh, that's awesome. And it was one, it was one of the most profound moments of my life, because oh. she really did not say anything. Mm-hmm. And the picture is, uh, and she's a beautiful Asian woman. She's so gorgeous. And... Uh, and there's a picture, and it's this big J, someone who's a big gynecologist here in Beverly Hills. And uh, uh, he's, you know, the, the woman's laying there, my friend, and her legs are up, and he's standing, and the light goes bright, and there's a little baby arm reaching up for the light. Oh, that's and crazy. He, and, uh, and the father is in the background crying. Oh. 
Lex Cassidy, thank you very much for coming on the show. Lex Cassidy, Lex Luther, Lex Bravo, Mrs. Bravo, <laughs> Mrs. B. I'm happy you came on the show. I'm happy well, you guys you got to meet me. because you're both two beautiful women that showed you little titties and you know what I'm saying? Look, <laughs> look what happened. You're still here and you're still bad motherfuckers. So there's a stigma attached to that, but not you guys. You guys are fucking special women. I'm lucky I have you as both in my life. Let me tell you something, guys. For all my medical marijuana needs, you know me, especially over the Christmas holidays, I'm at NoHo CC, 4852 Lancashire, plain and simple. Tell them you listen to Beauty in the Podcast, and they'll give you a free fucking triple X cookie. Also, to my main sponsors, I love these motherfuckers, TaintedVisionArt.com. Let me tell you something. They've just added a link to their favorite Beauty and the Beast products. Go check it out. They got a Led Zeppelin Grateful Dead poster from the Phil Maurice. Uh They've got yeah. Bruce Lee, two Bruce Lee figures. One that I'm gonna air on the fucking uh, our little thing on the twenty on the Christmas you Eve. You mean our live upstream our that live we're gonna upshoot. try to pull off on Christmas Eve at nine o'clock, twelve yeah. o'clock Eastern time, like a midnight mass? That's right, midnight mass, beer and the beast. I'm gonna show you these, but they have a Bruce Lee doll, but it doesn't it's not him kicking ass. It's Bruce Lee with a movie projector shooting a kung fu movie. If that's not fucking oh, brilliant, really? and it's on sale for sixty nine bucks. They've got some great little Kush pillows. They got lemon Kush pillow and whatever. Either call them, put your order in 818 523 3975. They're PayPal certified. And you can use your Visa MasterCard. Go to TainTheVisionArt.com. Tell them we sent you. Get 15% off. BDB15%.com. And Felicia, I love you to death. Merry Christmas, my little sexy I motherfucker. I know. Merry Christmas. See, and, uh, uh, I do want to talk about real quickly the live upstream that we're going to try to pull off uh, on uh, The Christmas 24th, Eve. Saturday night. Mm-hmm. You're going to sit around with your family. Let's, let's pretend your rank gets on your fucking nerves. No more sitting there no more. Make them believe you want to watch mm-hmm. some dumb movie on pretend fucking you Lifetime. Pretend three glasses of wine too much. Tell go them to that you room. want to go in. Get on your computer. We're going to do a live upstream. we got special guests. Some special guest appearances. Some people are going to drop in. Just come and see how Beauty and the Beast podcast spends their holiday with the beautiful Felicia she'll be cooking and she'll be hostessing. We're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, interview a few people. You'll yes. meet Felicia's world, a few a sneak peek into a world. We're gonna yeah. show you what's at Tainted Vision Archive and what else you have planned for us. Oh, uh, just that. Let's hope that we can pull it off. <laughs> hopefully, 2012 will be a great year. I'm yeah. talking Felicia is doing a Beauty and the Beast bikini calendar. You know what I'm oh, saying? Yeah. All yeah. different fucking months. You open up your calendar. There's Felicia Michael I don't Michael think we smile. need to have me in a bikini in the bad year of 2012 when um, the Mayans say. <laughs> Once the Mayans see that monkey, they'll change their mind. You know what I'm saying? They'll postpone it for five years. They, they'll send a little apocalypto over here to eat that fucking dragon of death. You know what I'm saying? Well. I love you, cock collector. We'll see these people on a, thir- on a Saturday night, 9 p.m. Yes, sir. All right. Bye. Midnight in the East Coast. We love you. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you for all the wishes and the, the love you've given myself and Felicia this year. You guys have been fucking amazing. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Love you. <laughs>